Hi there, I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. We're going to hear a lot of fish stories here on Michigan Outdoors, and we're going to start out this first premiere show with, well, it could have been a sad tale. Randy Acker, back in, on July 19th, caught a fish that he thought was a state record brown trout, 32 pounds. This is a mount of a brown trout right here. Ten days later, Randy lost his record to Elaine Bender. Here we have a photo of Elaine with her brown trout record. She was proclaimed the winner in that category, 32 pounds, 10 ounces. That was just 10 days later. Well, Randy was a little upset about that, but both of them were told just not too long after that that they didn't have brown trout records at all. Dr. Jerry Smith from University of Michigan, you were the one who made the final determination that they didn't have brown trout. What did they have? Reeve Bailey and I at the University of Michigan determined that they had Atlantic salmon rather than brown trout. What a heartbreaker. They weren't record winners. Well, it turns out that they had record-breaking Atlantic salmon anyway, so oh. they should be pleased. A nice ending to that story, but the question is, how did that confusion come about? There were a lot of biologists, a lot of fishermen, a lot of people who looked at these fish and they said, ah, that's a, those were brown trout. Well, there are about five characters that uh, are easy to use to tell these two fish apart, but unfortunately these five easy to use characters are not very reliable. And in order to tell them apart with 100% reliability, we have to go to some technical characters that uh, are not generally known. Well, what are the ones that don't always work? Well, the most popular one is called tailing the fish. In a brown trout, the fisherman attempts to hold the fish like this by its own weight with the fish's head down. The, slips right through his hand. the tail is so thick that the fish slips through his hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, on an Atlantic salmon, where you can see a more slender area in the body right here, uh, one's grip can hold a 30-pound fish. So I assume on the Atlantic salmon that these two people caught, it slipped through the hands. Yes, it did that because the fish was so fat that for all practical purposes, it was behaving in this region like it was a brown trout. Well, some of the other characteristics, the coloration, the spots, and so on, also threw the fishermen off. Now, what did you use to tell these fish apart? Well, we have to use the size of the scales, first of all. An Atlantic salmon has uh, much larger scales, and if we count the scales along the row of the body right here, and we come out with a number less than 120, it's a, an Atlantic salmon. What else? Well, uh, in the roof of the mouth of these two fish, we find a, a striking difference in the kind of teeth that they have. A brown trout in the roof of the mouth has a row of 10 to 18 teeth running right down the center. And what about an Atlantic? The Atlantic salmon has either no teeth there at all or perhaps uh, two to six teeth. And of course you have other techniques also for telling these apart. It, this is something that fishermen are going to have to go to with these larger trophy fish, the scientific uh, details. That's right? right. I think probably one of the most reliable characteristics involves lifting the gill cover here, looking at the first gill arch, and counting the number of tooth-like gill rakers on that arch. Well, now, we have to come out with a number higher than 19 to be an Atlantic salmon, or if it's lower than 19, we have a brown trout. You can see why Dr. Jerry Smith from University of Michigan was brought in to make this determination, but for Elaine Bender and Randy Acker, they were state record holders in the Atlantic salmon division, so congratulations to them. Now, how about a report from the DNR, Ed? Thanks, Fred. Well, the DNR's Wildlife Division has just produced a new book for Michigan hunters. It's called Hunting in Michigan, the Early 80s. Now, this book is packed with maps that show deer density in every county in the northern two-thirds of Michigan. For instance, in Clare County, the shaded areas show you where the best chances of finding deer are. This book also has hunting tips by area biologists, and it's full of state area game maps. But most important, it's current. This book was conceived this spring, and the maps were drawn up this summer. So they should help you with hunting this fall and for the next few falls to come. A really fine book. From the Wildlife Division, they tell us that 180,000 hunters this year will take deer. So we're expecting a lot of entries in the DNR's Big Buck Contest. You pick up entry forms at highway checking stations and at all DNR offices. So you don't have any excuse if you get a trophy and you don't fill out this form. 
The form tells you how to do the initial scoring, let a DNR employee and verify it, and if you're in the top 20 of the categories, you'll be in the running for prizes including patches, plaques, certificates, a special invitation to MUCC's Outdoor Rama on Big Buck Night, and if you get your entry in right away, you might be asked to show up on December 3rd for some special prizes right here on Michigan Outdoors. And this is the Fisheries Division Master Angler Record Form. This one's already filled out, but if you catch a big fish that meets or beats the minimum weights on one of the 50 fish listed on the back, get it weighed on certified scales, have it checked by a DNR biologist, take a picture of it, and you'll get an arm patch. And if it's one of the top three caught this year in your category, you'll get a certificate and recognition at Outdoor Rama's Master Angler Night in 1982. And filling out this form could put you in front of the cameras right here on Michigan Outdoors. These forms are available at any DNR office, so if you're a master angler, why don't you get some credit for it? Now, Fred, I hear you're hunting for some solutions to some what, well, what age-old problem? Lead, it's the age-old problem of gun safety. Always check that action before you take a gun down, before you take it out of a case, and before you put it back. That's one rule. There's a number of rules of gun safety that really should be followed. We're going to have 750,000 hunters in the woods in just 10 days for deer season. We've always had, oh, 20 up to 30 fatalities during deer seasons. We're talking back in the 1930s and 40s until we had some laws and some requirements. Hunter education, Jim Dabb, that's your specialty with the DNR. That's helped cut down on hunting accidents, has it not? It's drastically reduced accidents. Especially you know. in that young age group. Especially in the age group up to about 20 years old. Okay, well our Michigan Outdoors viewers are going to be reading the paper after deer season starts and it's going to say, probably say again, 20 fatalities uh, during deer season. Uh, but these aren't firearm fatalities. These are not. Uh, last year we had six firearm fatalities. Okay, let's the rest involved heart attacks and drownings, car accidents, asphyxiations in camps. Let's concentrate on those six right now okay uh, and I happen to know that four of them were what we call unintentional discharge unintentional would you show me how that happened how those four happened? okay Fred two of them involved the shooter stumbling so that we're one really... of them one of the fatals was self-inflicted the other one he shot his partner well that's that's part stumbling not watching muzzle control yeah partly gun safety partly just walking right motor skills motor paying skills. paying attention to where you're going and of course that can be kind of tough when you're going out in the morning. It's dark. Right, These it can. accidents can happen at twilight. You're tired. You're been tired out. all day. But again, two hands on the firearm at all times. Keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. You can control this muzzle. Okay, anytime. now hunters, hunters could work on that and eliminate those right. two for A little bit of practice in handling. Now, what about these loading and unloading accidents? We had one in each of those categories last year. Both of them involved hunting partners. Wow, that's tragic. Very simple. You and I are hunting. Fred, stand up. Simulate loading a firearm or unloading. Just turn your, ba turn your back to mm -hmm. me, and I'll turn my back away from you, and it's very simple. That's the best You're way to do it. You're not going to shoot your partner in the mm -hmm. back. But obviously that didn't happen when these people are loading and unloading. Probably not thinking what they're doing. They're saying, hey, I saw this buck mm -hmm. in the woods and racking the shells out. Kerpow. It happens, unfortunately. Boy. Unfortunately. It certainly is. And again, it is an unintentional discharge. Two of the other accidents mm. were of, of hunters that didn't see the other hunter. That's shot. correct. We don't really have the data as to how much hunter orange they were wearing, but tell me just a little bit about this hunter orange law. This is what people used to wear a lot, the old black and red wool jackets. That's tradition. It's almost camouflage, too. It is. Under poor light conditions, which we normally have during mm -hmm. November hunting season, it looks black. So now we have the blaze orange law. You must wear a blaze jacket. Blaze orange is mandatory for all firearm hunting with a couple of exceptions mm -hmm. uh, waterfall hunting crow and turkey hunting but during deer hunting. season it's wear a jacket at least wear a jacket a vest or a hat this is what's required by law the more orange you got on the better so the chances are reasonable that maybe if hunters followed these mm -hmm. rules we might have zero firearm fatalities I would this year. love to see it so would I. Let's set a record this year. Hunters, that's something to shoot for. Thank you, Jim Dabb. Now let's talk about a form of hunting that's primitive, that uses a, a lethal weapon, but it's certainly not a gun. The weapon? A hawk. The sport? Well, it's a medieval sport, an age-old sport. Falconry. We have a bird right here. His name is Uther. Joe Voro, you're the owner and handler. What kind of hawk is he? This is a goshawk, Fred, and uh, he's, he's a male goshawk, three years of age. 
Did he come from Michigan? No, he's come from another. Came from another state. Uh, I obtained permit to take him, and I uh, obtained him when he was 13 days of age. Well, uh, I happen to know that you Falconers spend a lot more time practicing with your weapons, as it were, than maybe a gun hunter or even a bow hunter. How much do you spend every day with it? Oh, it's a daily chore. Um, in the hunting se during the hunting season, I might uh, spend an hour, an hour and a half a day uh, hunting with him. On the off season, when he's molting, when the uh, uh, when the animal's not in season, um, it's probably half hour a day with him. Well, you spend a lot of time. He's almost like a kid, mm -hmm. part of your family. Now That's right. everybody has baby pictures. Mm -hmm. I bet you're no different. Certainly, I've got uh, quite a few pictures. Um, that's Uther on the uh, on the left. Uh, he's about uh, 20 days of age at the at the time, and he's with another goshawk uh, belonging to a friend of mine. How long did the two goshawks spend together uh, before you separated them? Oh, just a few days. Uh, a friend of mine was visiting me, and uh, we had the two birds together, and then he went back to Colorado. Uh, do you feed them, obviously not with a bottle like you do baby raccoons and things, but you must do something special. Mm -hmm. They're fed uh, fresh meat, but whole, whole birds, whole animals, everything is ground up or shaved very finely. They're predators from right from the start. That's right. They have to have meat. Now, how, how old is the bird right there? Oh, he's in, in uh, 30, 30, um, 30, mm -hmm. 30 days of age. So they put on the feathers fairly quickly. Yes, yes. Well, in flight, a goshawk uh, looks like a, what we call a nighthawk, mm -hmm. which is more of a songbird, but they have slender wings, highly maneuverable. Yes, and, and, and very fast uh, as well. Uh, Uther is particularly fast in, in flight. Will you say you've taken pheasants with this bird, ducks? Mm -hmm. Rabbits? Rabbits, yes. So we That's talk it. about being fast and maneuverable in flight. I mean, they have to really be outrageously fast, don't they, to catch birds like that? Uh, yes, and, and, but he has to catch them within 60 or 80 yards, and after that, uh, they just get too far ahead of him, and he gives up. Ah, well, why don't you try feeding him here? I know you have some, some fresh meat well, we'll see from the pheasant that you've taken. Well, he goes right after that. Chews it right up. The, the beak on a bird like this and the talons, people tend to be... Uh, somewhat afraid of? Uh, the beak not so much. It's not a defense mechanism for them, but the talons are particularly strong and sharp and that's what you have to be careful of and that's how they do the killing with the talons. People think that nature is, you know, beautiful and these birds, uh, these birds don't really spread much happiness in the wild, do they? Uh, no, but they're part of the natural, uh, uh, the natural scheme of things, so uh, they belong there and they do what's natural. What a way to hunt with a, with a falcon. Don't you stand a chance of losing that bird when, when you turn it loose on a pheasant? Or? Uh, sure, quite often. And falcons are lost and hawks are lost. Uh, but uh, if they're lost um, uh, permanently from the falconer, they just re, uh, rejoin the wild population. Boy, that's a, that's a hard way to go, Joe. A primitive sport you have there. Sometime we're going to have to have you back and show us how you train these birds and the amount of time you spent. That would really be a heartbreaker to lose a bird after you spent a couple years is. with it. It certainly is. Okay, well right now, let's talk about another primitive type sport. Deer hunting is something that people have done with bow and arrow, uh, with muzzle loaders, sort of a, a back to the more primitive methods of doing it. And right now, let's look at deer hunting from a tent, the old tent camp. Here's how I got started deer hunting. Ron Bacon from Okemos was the hunting buddy who taught me these basics. He hunted from a tent camp like this for many years. He has an ideal setting near a forested area, near some running water, which we could use for washing and cleaning up. You want a nice, well-drained, reasonably flat area to set up the tent. And in our case, we had a natural grassy clearing where we don't have to beat down any brambles or do any cutting or chopping of underbrush, contend with roots under the tent. We're right next to a path where we have easy access to our deer hunting area. We aren't bothered by other hunters in the woods like this either. In the morning, we can get up. We know we're the first ones in the woods to lay claim to our blinds. You can see the soil is soft. It drains well in case there's rain or snow that melts, so we won't wake up sitting in a puddle. Now, a lot of people remember camping years ago, maybe you do, when there were ridge poles inside the tent. Well, this particular tent really isn't modern anymore. They have even more modern ones than this, but it does have an exterior frame, which leaves the inside open. The rubberized floor is waterproof. It makes camping in a tent a whole new experience. The ground cloth we use, we put inside the tent, not on the ground. Remember, the floor of these new modern tents are rubberized. So they shouldn't leak, and water will drain out from under the bottom of the tent through the soil. But if you put a canvas ground cloth down, that canvas will soak up the water, and if anything, it'll retain it under the tent. So you actually have more chance of getting water inside. And besides, if you want to clean the floor of the tent, just pull the ground cloth out and shake it. 
I'm sure you've noticed that our pile of camping gear is not what you'd call horrendously expensive. In fact, you can pick up a lot of these items at garage sales for only a few dollars. Well, like a mattress here. In November, you don't want an air mattress. That is, if keeping warm at night is at all important to you. you now, the air in an air mattress constantly circulates all night long. Every time you move, that air moves and it is cold and it keeps you cold. A foam pad or mattress right on the ground is the best, most comfortable, warmest way to go. And speaking of warmth, if you're still concerned, do what we did. Take summer weight sleeping bags, put them inside your heavy duty winter down bag. Give you an extra bit of warmth that you just might enjoy if those temperatures get down to the 20s or even the teens. Honestly, when it gets like that, I wear a fresh pair of wool socks to bed and a fresh pair of long johns. Don't wear the ones you wore all day. They'll be damp and cold. And I wear a knit cap to bed, too. Now, that really makes a lot of difference, keeping your head warm. Who cares how you look when you're inside two sleeping bags in the woods in November when it's dark, it's 15 degrees outside? I certainly don't. I'm comfortable, and that's what matters. I should mention that cot that Ron just took in the tent, by the way, was not to sleep on. Cots also can be cold. We use it to dry our clothes on. We use it as a shelf, store things on it and under it. And keeping dry is extremely important. So another thing we carry along is a big tarp to throw over the tent just in case it looks like blowing, freezing rain might be coming up. If you stay dry in the woods, you can stay warm. Another tip is don't wear the same long johns into the woods that you wore to bed at night or the same socks. They might feel okay and you might think that they're warm, but they're a bit damp just from the respiration of your body and you'll be cold in the morning in the woods and there's no need to be cold even when you're camping in November like this. We have a tree right next to our tent, which is very convenient. Ron builds attachments and leans them next to the tree. Good idea to bring along some wood, some nails, and a hammer. You never can tell what little basic improvements or additions could make that camp a little more luxurious. Now, a hatchet is a basic camp tool. Of course, a good old gas lantern is something we couldn't do without. A camp kitchen is another one of the handy items you'll find that if you camp like we do is extremely handy. Now, did you ever take food to a camp out in paper bags or cardboard boxes? Well, make yourself a cupboard like this one for the canned goods and utensils. You can put a drawer in it for silverware. Saves a lot of grief if you happen to have a few hungry squirrels or mice around too. Keeps your kitchen organized. And a little setup like this, we can just throw a small tarp over it to protect it from the elements. Now our camp refrigerator. Again, very basic type of fridge, but it does the job. I remember one year, the problem was keeping our food from freezing, not the other way around. Now this area that Ron has used for many years, he digs up the same basic garbage pit. Take tin cans, smash them down, burn them in the fire all week long, and when after they're buried, they disintegrate fairly quickly. Of course, we carry our bottles out, and we fill this pit with the dirt as we add the garbage. By the end of the week, we cover it up. You can hardly tell that anyone has camped here. Make yourself a little fire pit. Rim it with rocks. We just clear off the leaves, and we can find last year's fire pit. Use good-sized rocks, 10, 12 inches in diameter, making a rim around the outside so you can lay a grid across it. Now, Ron carries a, a dirty old grid in a canvas bag, but I'll tell you, it makes cooking over a fire something pleasant and predictable. Just let your fry pan slip off the rocks just once. you really appreciate a grid like this. Don't let anybody tell you that you should use a hatchet or axe for cutting firewood. Now, there's several reasons for this. One is just plain safety. Accidents with axes slipping and cutting shins or feet are all too common. And besides, if you watch the way this buck saw cuts through wood, and if you've ever tried it yourself, you'd realize it actually takes much less energy. It does a better job faster. It doesn't waste wood either when you use a good sharp saw. So spend your time the first day in deer camp gathering wood. 
get some good dry wood that's been down. You don't know what the conditions will be later in the week. And if you use your energy then, you can cut enough wood for the week. Take an old shower curtain, put it over your stack of wood too. That way it'll take any rain or snow. When you come back at the end of the day from being in the woods, deer hunting, pursuing those big bucks, you'll be tired, you'll be hungry, maybe a little cold. Nothing will warm you up like a good hot meal over a nice warm campfire. That's the way we did it for several years. It's very enjoyable, but you know, it's relaxing out over a campfire, but you don't want to spend your evening slaving over a hot camp stove or a hot fire either. You want to sit around and think about those big bucks and tell the tales. And here's a suggestion for a way to make a few meals at home and take them deer hunting. And really, it's the way to go in the woods. And when I say this is the way to go when you're camping in the woods, I mean because it's easy. Not only easy, but it tastes great. It warms your stomach after a hard day of deer hunting. Now, this recipe is for sweet and spicy chili. It really isn't too difficult. I think you can follow along. You can make it up in advance, freeze it, thaw it out at deer camp just before you heat it up. That's all it takes. You can heat it over your camp stove or the campfire. Couldn't be any easier. This recipe isn't too hard to make either. First of all, you brown a couple of pounds of hamburger. In this case, I used venison burger. Trim the fat off of it. That's one problem that people have when they make venison burger. They leave too much of the deer fat in it. You really need to use pork fat or beef fat. But anyway, you brown the burger. Do it in a, in, not in a frying pan necessarily. Do it in the same pot you're going to cook the chili in. Add some onions, one or two chopped onions, and you're ready to go. It's, that, that'll save washing an extra pan when you're done if you fry this up and brown it in the same pan you cook the chili in. Now we're going to put a quarter teaspoon of salt, toss it into the pot, followed by two cans of tomato soup. Now this is the raw stuff right from the can. You don't add any water or milk to dilute it. After you've added the two cans of tomato soup, put in a couple cans of chili beans. Now they make some spicy chili beans, spicier ones than that. You might not need it depending on when we get to the spicy part of this recipe. Right now you'll add a large can of whole tomatoes. These don't really have to come from a can. If you've canned tomatoes from the garden in the summer, that's fine. Toss them in. Told you this was an easy recipe. Believe it or not, we finished the hard part. That was opening the cans. From here on out, it's all downhill. Now this is called sweet and spicy chili for a particular reason. Two ingredients. The sweet one is brown sugar. The spicy, well, that's chili powder, of course. First. In goes the brown sugar and then the chili powder. We use about four tablespoons of brown sugar. You might want to add more depending on your taste. And how much chili powder? Well, again, that's up to the taste. One thing I found with this recipe, I mean, how much do you put in? I don't know, just keep adding it. I add quite a bit. I even like to add a little of those cayenne peppers and the chopped dried peppers. I like a little zing to my chili when I'm in the woods. Believe it or not, the amount of chili pepper you saw me put in there still wasn't enough when we cooked that over the open fire. But you don't want to add too much, you know. You can always add a little more around the campfire, but you can't take it out. But that's all there is to this recipe. Simmer it for a while on the stove. Freeze it. All you need to do is heat it up when you want to eat it in the woods. This is really good chili, perfect for deer camp because it's a hot meal that's easy to prepare, simple and delicious. Ron Bacon thought it was mighty good. Isn't it, Ron? Sweet and spicy chili made with venison burger. Can't beat it. Well, we're going to be having big bucks on this show during the next month. We have a big buck contest tied in with the DNR's big buck contest. Well, that'll be December 3rd right here on the show. I hope you get a trophy buck so you can join us right here on Michigan Outdoors. But speaking of trophies, you know, fishing season isn't over yet. There's a lot of trophies being caught. Let's find out our trophy report from fish that have been taken recently from Michigan Waters. 
You don't think of October as a month for trophy bass fishing, but this six and a half pound largemouth bass was caught at sunset by out-of-stater Mike Honig casting a plastic worm in Allegan County's Eagle Lake. This trophy smallmouth bass is only a quarter of an ounce above Master Angler minimum five pounds, but Dennis Gloppa from Alto is happy. He caught it early afternoon on a minnow from Hardy Pond in Nuego County. An 11 pound, three ounce whopper of a walleye taken from the Asabo River on a Clio. Jim Goodman from Saginaw caught it at four in the morning. Jim, next time you take a picture of your trophy, let's see what you look like too, okay? Joanne Anderson from Illinois was fishing for walleye with a night crawler in Lake Gogebic in the UP. She caught a cousin to the walleye, a trophy perch weighing two pounds, one ounce. Ruby Reynolds came up from Ohio to fish off Manistee. A green Northport nailer got her this 15 pound steelhead. And the big one of the week, two ounces above master angler minimum of 30 pounds, Gladys Booby from Holland caught this king salmon trolling a skinny dipper. Now, I'm not referring to her husband, he was just holding the fish. She caught it at noon in Lake Michigan during the September salmon run. Now for a weekend forecast in Michigan outdoors, I guarantee you, or well, almost guarantee you, I won't have another forecast like this this year. Warm, sunny, nice for duck hunters, it's awful. The flight ducks are either up north or down south. They've moved through the state or else they're holding back. Duck hunting has just been a washout. Pheasant hunting, they really haven't harvested enough corn in the thumb in the areas we have pheasants uh, to make enough difference. It's still hard to roust them out of the cornfields. Fishing, though, a couple hot spots. Houghton Lake for walleye. They've been taking some nice ones, up to six, eight pounds even. In the evening, at night, also down here off Saugatuck, Douglas, next year's salmon are hitting. Now, this year's salmon are really done in the streams, but we have two to five pound coho, two to 15 pound Chinook. There's some browns, some steelhead. Great weekend in Michigan outdoors. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Join me right here next week. Rugged shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. And sometimes, when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can. Tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan.